great piece. Um, there were little inaccuracies in it. <laughs> um, the hearings were not held in Washington. They were held in California. Senator Cranston was not the person that I was kind of chastising. Um, and uh, the band that was supposed to have been there wasn't. So, but basically I think what's really important about drunk history piece is that it's part of drunk history shows. And so for those of you who watch drunk history, how many of you do or know about it? Yeah, so anyway, um, they do three segments in one show, so it's 30 minutes. So when this piece aired, the pieces, uh, the first piece was on a suffragette, the second piece was on the Selma walkouts and focusing on the high school student who led the Selma walkouts, and then this piece. So people watched it because, drunk history for those who watch it, I'm sure it's not all accurate, but it was really, I think 100,000 people saw it, the first showing. That's so great. Yeah. Um, so what I'm going to do, we're going to, now we're going to introduce Judy, <laughs> which we're shifting things around a little bit, but we wanted to be able to show that, and it's so nice to hear your reflections. Um, uh, for those of you um, for whom it's not uh, transparent, we're up here um, on the uh, elevated podium here or elevated platform uh, with Judy here at my left. And what I'm going to right now do is call up Sarah Minkara, but not before I get to introduce her. Sarah is a Harvard Kennedy School alumna, MPP, class of 2014. She is the founder and CEO of Empowerment Through Integration, which is a nonprofit that is helping to build a more inclusive society through initiatives that empower youth with disability and that challenge stereotypes about people with disabilities. So the idea of ETA actually um, came when Sarah was an undergraduate at Wellesley College. She was a mathematics and economics major heading for a career in academia when a uh, grant from the Clinton Foundation uh, set her off on another path. She is Lebanese American and she won a grant to run an inclusive summer camp in Lebanon. And um, following that experience, she founded ETI, and she explained to me that she came to the Kennedy School to learn how to run and grow an international organization that could make systemic change. And since graduation, she has been doing that work. She has taken ETI uh, global, and um, it is pursuing its mission of disrupting the narrative surrounding disability from a charity-based perspective to a value-based perspective, in, his, in her words, so that every single stakeholder sees the value in the inclusion of people with disability. And in 2017, Sarah Mancara was recognized by Forbes magazine in their global list of 30 under 30 social entrepreneurs. So please join me in welcoming Sarah, who will give now our formal introduction. You're perfect. Beautiful. Okay. Good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing? Great. Beautiful. Woohoo. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> um, before I introduce Judy, which is um, go going to be such a honor for me, I first want to thank Hannah. Um, Hannah is actually the reason why we're all here. Um, we had a meeting months ago, and we we're talking about different things, and. Um, we talked about, we mentioned Judy at that point, and she made it happen. Um, so please give Hannah a big round of applause for really making this forum event happen. Okay, I need to get comfy. Okay, so um, when I was told that I was going to introduce Judy, I actually got really nervous 
not because I do a lot of public speaking and never get nervous, but this is the first time because um, it's such a great honor to be able to introduce an amazing woman like Judy. Um, Judy is an icon, is a force to be reckoned with, has no fear, is the first of many, many things and is a woman with one of the biggest hearts that I've ever met. But let me take you back to a story um, that I had a few weeks ago, actually, in Rwanda. And I'll explain why I'm even talking about this. I was in Rwanda, and I had a meeting um, with a US ambassador to Rwanda. And we're sitting down. And he was like, Sarah, let me tell you. There's this woman, an amazing woman that changed my life and made me think about the importance of disability inclusion when I was working in Ethiopia. And in my head, I was like, I know who, he, who he's going to say. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> and I was waiting for him. And he's like, do you know her, Judith Human? I was like, of course I know her. And I was waiting for you to say her name. But this is not the first time I was in a similar situation, similar setting, similar story. I've met with so many leaders whether it's ambassadors, senators, heads of state, whoever, where Judy is the woman that's impacted their lives and helped them rethink and understand and see the value of inclusion of people with disabilities, whether locally, nationally, or internationally. And she started all of this work at a really young age. Starting at age 22, where she sued the Board of Education of New York. Why? Yes, let's clap. <laughs> because they did not want to give her a teaching license because she was in a wheelchair. She sued, she won, and she became the first teacher with a physical disability to be in that system in New York City. She started her work at a really young age, and she continued. She continued and she worked on every single legislation ever since then, whether um, it's the 504 protection law, whether it's the ADA, and many more. She's the reason behind why I, as a person with disability, am able to go to school and be included and integrated and empowered. She's the first director of disability services at the city of uh, DC. She is the first senior advisor on disability and development at the World Bank. She's the first special advisor at the State Department in disability under Obama. She's the first of many. And she will continue to be the first of many, opening the path for many people with disability and others. As you saw, she led uh, an amazing sit-in for 25 days to get the 501 protection law established. She was the assistant secretary um, in the special education and the department of education during the Clinton administration. And on the side, she got six honorary doctorate. You know, <laughs> just a small thing. But let me talk on a personal level. I met Judy 10 years ago when I was 19 years old. I was doing an internship in DC, and my friend Debbie Chen, who also went to the Kennedy School, and we were both at Wellesley, she was interning at the State Department. She was like, Sarah, I met this amazing woman. Come and meet her. And she took me to the State Department, and she brought me into Judy's office, and I just became one of her mentees. She took me under her wing, and she became my mentor, my advisor, my friend, and I also call her my DC mom. And she is the empower, she empowers so many people, not just me. And she supports them. And she gives them guidance in terms of how to pursue their own potential and own value. I'm so lucky to call you my DC mom. I've learned so much from you. I love you. I respect you. I learn er so much from you every single day and I'm honored to be on stage with you. So please welcome me with a big round of applause to welcome Judy Human to today's evening. So I just wanna say, you know, many of you are mentors to people and 
one of the exciting things is to be able to meet people like Sarah and to be able to see great promise. And so when I met with Sarah, I remember exactly where she was sitting in my office. You know, I knew right away that there was a light within her. And I think, I just before we get into your questions, just to say, um, Tom Hare, who's here, who's a retired professor um, at Harvard in the School of Education, Tom was the director of special education and rehabilitative services when I was uh, assistant secretary at the Department of Education. And I think why I want to, you know, call him out is we had the ability to assemble a really amazing people of le leaders uh, within the Department of Education. We had a great secretary, Secretary Riley. I think from a disability perspective, uh, really probably the best secretary there ever was in the disability area. So I know I get called out for doing many things and I've done many things in my life, but the reality is no one person can ever do anything, everything. And so we're a team and I think that's what's really important and I know some of you in the room and I don't know others and I think at the end of the day when we leave today, why I was interested in doing this is really to share ideas um, together and to encourage and um, inspire you. Uh, not, we, we are hesitant about using the word inspiration and disability, <laughs> but so I'm, I'm saying it with caution. But I think in reality it's to learn that I presume those of you are, who are here are either doing some work in the area of disability, may have a disability yourself or both, um, but you're here to learn. So that's what I think we're going to be able to do tonight is have a reasonable discussion that will provide some new information. And as Harvard is moving forward, uh, trying to become a university that really is more inclusive of disability, that uh, programs like this really demonstrate the institution's commitment to really kind of elevating the bar on what it's going to be doing. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I almost feel like I should hand the program over to you. <laughs> I don't, I'm going to throw away my script. I do want to go. I am going to build, though, on those comments to go to um, my first question without any of my uh, pre-scripted preface. And, and can I build on that comment and thinking about, you've got this forthcoming book, and you've played, as Sarah highlighted, so many different roles in public service um, as an activist, as a nonprofit institution builder, as an advisor to presidents, to the World Bank, to the Ford Foundation, just in so many ways um, you've been a public leader. But you highlight in your book your activism, and in particular I was wondering if you could start off talking about the importance, to your point here, of uh, political organizing. Uh, and activism for m advancing the cause of um, people with disabilities? Uh, so I, it's all because I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> I firmly believe if I wasn't from Brooklyn, I wouldn't be the person I am today. Uh, that's kind of a joke, but not completely a joke. Um, so I think, you know, for me and many of my friends, in the 1960s, and there's a film that's going to be coming out next year, and Harvard maybe will want to show it. It's called Crip Camp, and it's about five or six disabled individuals who all went to a camp upstate New York called Camp Jeanette. And the film is really about us as younger disabled people being able to come together and really um, be able to grow and mature both as teenagers, but also to begin to have um, more discussions about what we were concerned about at that stage in our lives. Um, the American dream was something that more of us, even the white disabled individuals, were feeling that the American dream was not going to come our way because of all the acts of discrimination that were occurring and that weren't being called discrimination. I think we learned a lot from television. Television had a major impact on my generation because we were able to see things that were going on 
in the area of the civil rights movement. And we were able to see that people who were so committed to changing society that they were risking their lives in very serious ways. And I think for myself and many friends, we were really inspired by that. We were also really discouraged about the fact that the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1964, five, uh, failed to include disabled people. So um, for us, and of course we were young, and so did we really understand all the legislative stuff that was going on? No, we didn't. Uh, but we really did see that there was more discussion going on about racism, about um, sexism, about ageism, but in the area of disability, not so much. And that much of what was being done in the area of disability was still dropping a quarter um, in your local store for cure of one disability or not. And the Jerry Lewis telethon and the CP telethon, much of which many of you don't know about because those telethons have not been on television for a long time. But every September on Labor Day, there was a 24-hour telethon um, run by the Muscular Dystrophy Association that Jerry Lewis was the champion of. And basically, it was a way of pulling people's heartstrings to give money. And we all would joke about try to go out and get a job the day after a telethon if you had a disability. Because really, who was going to be there that was wanting to hire you? So I think these points are all important that we were really, and then more of us were getting to go to college. And I think when those of us who were able to go to universities were also, it was the anti-war movement that was going on. So we were involved in many different things. And then, like I went to Long Island University in Brooklyn and there was no disabled student service office. And there were disabled student services offices which were beginning in colleges around the United States, but nothing where we were, nothing at Brooklyn College or the CUNY system. And so students were beginning to organize to get services on campus because we were having difficulty, lack of accessibility, issues with faculty who were doing things that today would have been considered illegal. But I think it's also important to put in the context that there was no Title V of the Rehab Act which meant there was no 504, no 501, no 503. There was no IDEA or Educational Handicapped Children's Act. Um, there was a little law that had been passed in 1968, which dealt with the issue of accessibility of ramps on corners of streets. So that was like the big piece, right? Which of course was nothing. So I think that's really, I define what was going on in the late 60s and 70s it's kind of being in a candy store because every issue, there was a problem. Transportation, healthcare, education, employment, issues around people who are deaf or blind or had intellectual disabilities or physical disabilities or invisible disabilities. Nothing was really going right. And as I said earlier, one of the big problems is no one called it discrimination. Mm -hmm. It wasn't discrimination. It was People didn't mean it. People didn't understand. They didn't know better. And so when you kind of describe acts of discrimination in that way, it also makes it difficult for those who are being discriminated against. And in the area of disability, I think what's important is how do we get together and how did we get together? So your family typically, there might not be any other disabled people there. Your parents like mine who were great, but they didn't talk about discrimination until later on. It was like, this happened, well, they didn't know better. They didn't mean it. So I, I think organizing was something that came about naturally from looking at what others were doing. And we were mimicking many of the other activities that others were doing. Our numbers were way less. Mm -hmm. So like demonstrations in New York when we had 50 people shutting down Madison Avenue, like. For a non-disabled group, 50 people would be, nobody would even look at it. <laughs> but 50 people using wheelchairs and you know, had all kinds of disabilities shutting down Madison Avenue, that was a big deal. 
didn't get much coverage, but we were really proud of what we did. And taking over Nixon headquarters twice uh, before the election in New York City, those were all big deals. So we were also learning how to organize and how to get people to speak up for themselves. And I think, so one of the issues that's gone on over the last 40, 50 years um, really does relate back to what I was saying on the charity model. Because yeah. the charity model very much encourages you to look at a particular disability and to look at the issue of cure. It doesn't look at the overarching issue of discrimination. It doesn't look at why disabled people, even though the remedies may be different depending on who you are, not just your disability, the remedies may be different, but what we needed to be able to do was to convince legislators and the general public that systemic discrimination was going on and that there needed to be a resolution. There needed to be legislation. There needed to be an acceptance that discrimination was happening. And people maybe didn't mean it and didn't understand it, but it really didn't matter because the impact was one million disabled children not in school in 1975, which if that was the official government figure, you know the number was higher, and on and on. So organizing um, is something that we learned to do in order, I think it, it was a release for many of us to really be able to come out and be public about what was happening and not to feel ashamed about talking about it. Coming together as a group of people, you know, protesting the movie Coming Home, which um, was an anti-war film that John Voight played, a non-disabled person playing a disabled veteran. But the worst was they showed it in San Francisco in an inaccessible movie theater. <sighs> so we demonstrated against that and they moved it to an accessible movie theater. But yeah. So let me ask you a question. So those are very powerful examples. So now, but later in your career, you moved from outside of government to inside of government. And I want to, particularly at the Kennedy School, ask you to reflect on, you know, are there examples of particularly meaningful or valuable things that you were able to do inside of government that you might not have been able to do outside? Oh, yeah. Um, well, first of all, so I worked in nonprofit organizations for about 20 years. And I worked at the first Center for Independent Living in Berkeley, learned an incredible amount being there. I had I got my master's at Berkeley in public health and did a stint in Washington, D.C. for a year and a half for the chairman of the Pub uh, Labor and Public Welfare Committee, which was handling IDEA and Title uh, and 504 and other pieces of legislation. So for me, I think if I hadn't had that in my life, things would have been different learning about what was going on in the Congress, how laws were being made, meeting people, getting on the same page, influencing their thinking on disability, because there weren't a lot of disabled people working there, even though on the committee there were some really great staff, but they understood broadly, but being able to get more disabled people in was very helpful. And in 1993, when President Clinton had been elected, I got a call from someone. I really never expected to get a call asking me if I'd be interested in working for the administration. And this guy calls me, who I knew, and said, are you interested in working for the administration? And I thought, and I said, okay. And what would you be interested in? And I said, well, there's only one job I'd like. It's the Assistant Secretary of Education. If you've already given it away, no problem, but I don't want anything else. That's true, really. <laughs> and so um, I was called in for an interview with Secretary Riley and was offered the job. And what was great about that period was um, they really allowed us, because I was a political, uh, to look broadly for people. And when we did our interviews, it was someone from the Secretary's office and myself uh, for the senior positions. And one day they called me and asked me if I would interview someone who I absolutely knew I did not want to hire. Because <laughs> she'd applied for the job, she was interviewed for the job that I had gotten. And uh, I said, are you saying that I 
should interview or do I have to hire? And they were really great. They said, no, we want you to interview and give us your best judgment. So what was valuable about that was I really knew that in the work I was going to be doing in government, because um, OSERS had the Office of Special Education, the Rehabilitative Services Administration, and the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. My interest was not only to help advance the work that they were doing, but the work that I had done in the nonprofit world had very much convinced me that we couldn't just be doing work in disability in the disability silo. That if we were going to work in the Department of Education, we had to work in bilingual education and yeah. Title I education, on and on. And so the reason why I was interested in this job was because it would give me kind of a broader influence and allow me to bring people in. So I found Tom Hare um, because I was looking for someone who understood special education, but also understood poverty, uh, not just in the area of disability, and had a demonstrated record of being able to advance, like ultimately Boston and Chicago, to look at disability in a new way. And I was calling all over the country, and I called this one friend of ours, and she said, oh, we've got this great guy here. I didn't know Tom from anything, and hired him. A, because he was recommended by my friend, but B, because when I looked at his record, it was stellar. And so we were able to bring people in like that. Tom also respected parents, respected the disability community, and that was going to be important for what I was trying to do. I didn't want people who, I mean, I call myself an advocate. I didn't want people on the team who did not come from the movement, who didn't see the essential uh, nature of pulling people together and people who would be able to work within the government structure, but also challenge it. And I think a lot of what we had to do while we were there was challenge people's thinking to be able to become a part of many different things that we did. And also, we were really fortunate at that time um, under the Clinton administration, then the Obama administration, that there were disabled people who were appointed across government agencies. So it really allowed us to work not just in one agency, yeah. but we did work, for example, on disabled youth, and we worked with Social Security, and we worked with employment, uh, Department of Labor and HHS. And we held a conference, the first and only conference in the US on uh, disabled women. We raised a million dollars from across the government. We had a conference with 600 disabled women from around the world from 82 countries. Um, it was amazing. But at the national and local level, I think we were able to not, Tom and I met this morning, we weren't able to make all the changes that we wanted to, but it wasn't for lack of trying. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you know we brought partners to the table yeah. from civil society to talk with government representatives from legal who felt very uncomfortable you know, coming to a table where they had to talk with parents and legal advocates who, on the other hand, could be suing them. They were afraid of those discussions. But we were basically able to say, we've got to understand what people want. And we have to understand where the system is broken. And we're not going to get to the same point, because there will definitely be disagreements. But if we can get people's buy-in, feel like they're respected, then as we move forward, we'll have a commitment that ultimately, in the case of education for disabled kids, will benefit kids. I just want to, one uh, quick question. I want to make sure we turn over to the audience, but I want to move from the government service to the moment that we're in today where leaders, not only from government, but very much from the private sector, are struggling with these questions of diversity and inclusion and belonging. And so you have 
not quite the moment that you described with the activism of the 1960s, but you do have this moment of there is where there is more political activism and there is more pressure. You have this um, uh, brilliant and provocative quote in the report um, that you wrote for the Ford Foundation where you say, it is no longer acceptable not to include women. It is no longer acceptable not to include people of color uh, at the table, you say. Uh, but too often people haven't even checked whether the table is accessible. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could just share a little bit with us before we open it up to, um, to the group, what is your advice today to those leaders who are leaning forward and uh, grappling with these questions? So we could start with Harvard. Uh, <laughs> when that's not where we are. Um, I think disability is still pretty invisible. Yeah. And in part, I think it's because the community itself is not equally demanding as other communities are. So the absence of disability in many different ways is, I don't want to blame us, because that would be wrong, but it's because people don't feel like they are welcome at the table. And in many cases, not welcome at the table. And I think there are difficult issues that need to be discussed, but I think they have to be discussed. Um, Accenture this year did a study on diversity and employment. They were looking at it also from a disability perspective and they found that businesses that are taking diversity seriously and are including disability, are, are the businesses are doing better. I believe that and I was happy for the report, but you know, I hate things like hire a disabled person, they make better employees. They come in the winter and in the snow and they're like <laughs> crawling to work. And I'm like, really? Like, why do we feel like we have to, do, why do we have to do that? If everybody else is staying home, why do we feel? So my fantasy is I hire a non-disabled person and they do a bad job and I fire them. And I don't hire any more non-disabled people <laughs> because they failed. <laughs> and that's really very true when you think about disability. Why do people not hire disabled people? Well, if they don't do a good job, how can I let them go? So I'm not gonna hire them because I'm gonna assume they're not gonna do a good job. Um, and nothing I'm saying is like original. You can read it in all the literature. And I think you know universities like Harvard, which, you know, <laughs> one of the most prestigious universities in the world, needs to be leading on this issue, needs to be grappling with the difficult questions, um, needs to be embracing this, and I think in a public way to say, okay, we get it, there are things that we have not done right, but join us on the journey as we look to rectify what we've done wrong. And what I think is important about that is because disability cuts across all diversity, yeah. right? So it's women, it's people with different sexual orientations, it's people from different religious backgrounds, people of color, people from different socioeconomic groups. So if you wanna be looking at any one of those groups at Harvard, and you wanna look at who do we need to target because we're underrepresented, include disability in whatever group that is. Yeah. And um, I think we're at a different place, as you said, than we were you know, decades ago. And I think we're really, you know, universities are seeing, and I don't wanna just talk about universities, but we're seeing more people with different types of disabilities who are recognizing that they have disabilities, yes. um, people with invisible disabilities, which are the largest group of disabled people. And so, you know, one of the issues I think that's really important is allowing disabled people to see that coming forth and discussing who you are and where disability is a part of that. Because when you talk to younger disabled people, not just younger, but because I do this program called The Human Perspective, so I've interviewed about 100 people on it now, and a couple of the people that I interviewed were younger people, younger in their 20s, um, but they were talking about, you know, they have, multiple parts of themselves, but pulling them all together 
to be able to present themselves as a Latino, gay, disabled person yeah. is difficult. So I think we need to be looking at um, creating opportunities for people to be able to have these discussions where people don't have to feel ashamed, embarrassed, stigmatized, but you know, continuing to allow people to feel like it is okay to be angry that you have not gotten what you should be getting. You know, we look at the juvenile facilities, we look at adult prison systems, where in the juvenile facilities we're talking about 60% of juveniles having disabilities. Many of those individuals should have been identified when they were in early childhood primary secondary school. They weren't, they were pushed out. Many of them are non-white children and not a lot is going on in that area. More is going on, but it's really, universities like Harvard and others really could be shouting this out and looking at what needs to be done. Terrific, okay, let me open things up now to, um, there are microphones here and here, um, and I think, and up on the stairs as well, it's being pointed out to me. Do we have a, I will certainly take advantage if there, okay, great, we've got a, a, a question up here on the stairs. Hi, thank you, oh my God, it's loud. My name is Julia, um, I'm a first year MPP at the Kennedy School, thank you so much for tonight. Um, I moved here from Minneapolis and I work with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and I was wondering if you have any advice or resources for uh, ways to become more involved in the Cambridge disability community. Sure, so we have two people sitting over here, Tom and Bill. Um, <laughs> Bill retired from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. His background is not 100% in any area, but I would say he's one of the leading people in the area of working with people in, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I'm sure they'd be very happy to give you information. Um, there's a parent training information center here in Boston, uh, do you know them? And the Boston CIL. And Charlie Carr is, right, raise your hand Charlie, can you? Charlie's right over here. So Charlie doesn't live in Boston, but you live where? Methuen. <laughs> Up north. <laughs> Up north. <laughs> but Charlie also um, ran the Department of Rehabilitation. I don't know, Peggy, are you involved with IDD? Not, not too much in, in that, but we are trying to work on a community within the Kennedy School. And I certainly want to include you as a student. And you said Julia, is that your name? Okay, so Julia, you should walk down the stairs and go to these gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> right, and meet us at the reception. And Ari Naaman, too. Yes, absolutely. Great. Uh, is there another question here? Hey, Judy, Larry Goldberg here. Hi, Larry. So next year is the 30th anniversary of the ADA. How are we doing? <laughs> so um, how are we doing? Very good question. I think in some areas we're doing really well. I think in the built environment, transportation, things like that, I think we've seen some really important changes. Um, we, ha we are seeing more changes under Title I in the employment area, although I think all of us would say we have way more to go. But the discussion of um, employment of disabled individuals is getting more attention. Um, I would say that 30 years after the ADA, uh, we would have liked to have accomplished more. But then I think the issue really is the degree of discrimination that people have experienced and how organizations that need to be responsive have also, they're, everybody's learning. I mean, it's kind of inexcusable, but it's true that many people are still learning okay, I know I've done it wrong, but I don't know what to do next. And who's out there really helping what to do next? So when you look at whatever the area is, I would say that's one of the biggest deficits is really ramping up the knowledge that people need. It is, of course, using the system, filing complaints, going to court, but ultimately, I think what we wanna be able to do is have people 
you know, be able to become a part of society without having to do that. So we have a lot further to go. I mean, even funding for disability rights organizations from foundations is way below the funding that goes on for other civil rights organizations. I mean, if you look at the Ford Foundation where I had my fellowship from, um, Ford until like 2016, 17, really had a pretty explicit policy that it didn't, it didn't do disability. And so when Darren Walker came in and was challenged, he said, okay, this is wrong and he's working on it. But still, you know, they're one of the most influential foundations. I think they're doing good work on bringing other foundations along, but the actual amount of money that's coming out from the foundations to look at things like supporting civil rights, disability civil rights organizations is still not on par with other groups. So we have a lot more to go. I mean, anybody could dispute me. <laughs> Hi, Colin. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Judy. Uh, firstly, just as an alum of this place, it is amazing to see you speaking in the forum. I hope this is the first of many disability activists to speak in this venue. Um, um, I think a lot of the policy that gets made in institutions like this is disability policy, even if the people who are making it don't know it because it has an enormous impacts on people with disabilities in domains like healthcare and housing and transportation. Uh, how do you think we can make sure that experts in those areas consider the disability perspective when they often don't know to look? So I would say there are a number of ways. I talk about it as putting a disability lens on the work that's being done, and that the donors, those that are providing money for the research, need to include disability in what they're asking for. Um, I firmly believe that if you apply for money to do research on whatever, there should be a requirement in the area of diversity, which I presume is required in much of the work that would be going on at institutions like Harvard, um, that disability is a part of it. And if it's not appropriately addressed, then they don't get the money. And when Tom and I were at education, I, we really learned that People learn how to do things that they said they couldn't do if it meant that they were not going to get money for something. <laughs> Did they do it perfectly? No. Is there a lot more to be done? Yes. But, yeah. So I think there needs to be, at the leadership level, for policy work which is being done, a commitment to including disability like other groups and an acknowledgement that if you don't have the knowledge that you need about what it should look like, that you convene the people around you who know that. And when you're recruiting faculty and leadership positions, um, the word disability, if you're mentioning diversity at all, then disability needs to be in that list. Um, otherwise, it continues to be invisible. So, and I, you know, I think faculty and students also need to be pushing this um, because it's not going to happen by itself. Hello, um, my name is Owen. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm a freshman at Harvard College. Um, I was just wondering if you had a favorite story from your time working with the Obama administration. <laughs> a favorite story? I have a favorite story. I can't remember. My favorite story was when I worked in the Clinton administration. Um, I have favorite stories from Obama, too. But the Clinton story was Tom and I were working on the reauthorization of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. In 1992, when Clinton came in, we had a Democratic president and a Democratic House and Senate. In 1994, we lost the House and Senate. And so that was like a big deal for us. And when we were working on the reauthorization, uh, the Republicans wanted to, wanted to pass a provision that would allow children with disabilities um, who were exhibiting what you could call bad behavior to be able to be expelled from school. And we really were working hard um, against allowing the law to be changed to allow expulsion. We weren't saying that kids who had really difficult behavior shouldn't be 
removed from a regular classroom on, from time to time. But we were saying that exclusion of children from school was not right. And I think I remember Secretary Riley saying something like, if we have to tie them to a rack to learn, we will do that. But he, <laughs> I didn't make that up. So one day I got a call from the Assistant Secretary over at Legislative Affairs who said, we have got to get over to the White House right now because there is a meeting of the senior leadership to decide whether or not the White House is going to support expulsion of kids from school. So she came out of her building. I was able to get the accessible vehicle. We went over to the White House. I didn't know most of the people there. She knew all of them because she was Ledge Affairs. And the meeting was just breaking up. It was Leo Panetta and Stephanopoulos and the, the big guys. And she said, we've got to come back in. You've got to revisit this issue because they were about to support that position. And we were able to turn that around. So for me, that particular um, event was the most momentous of my, how many years, 14, 15 years in government because I really felt like we were able to make an important difference. Hi, Judy. Hi, Diana. <laughs> How are you? Good. Um, I, uh, you've spoken so much here about the US, um, and you have such a wealth of experience that goes you know, way beyond the US borders mm -hmm. from your work in the State Department and beyond. Um, and uh, that's my work, too, is in the international sphere, and it's also part of why I came to the Kennedy School. Um, and uh, it's so important to recognize that this is not just a domestic U.S. issue. 80% um, of persons with disabilities live in the developing world. So can you speak a little bit about how um, you have tied your experience to what's happening globally and how the Kennedy School can also uh, do that? Sure, okay. thank you. This is, you should introduce yourself though, Diana. Just give two seconds on who you are. Um, I'm the founding director of the Disability Rights Fund and the Disability Rights Advocacy Fund, and I'm a mid-career graduate as well. Um, and both DRF and DRAF are based here in Boston. We're a global grant maker, participatory grant maker, we have funded um, organizations of persons with disabilities in 34 countries around the world um, for more than $32 million. Uh, we're supporting disability rights movements in Africa, Asia, Pacific, Caribbean. We've supported them in Latin America. Um, and with our funding, there are now new disability acts in places like Bangladesh, Peru, Uganda, Indonesia. So thank you. So my parents came from Germany, were German Jews, and they fled Germany in the 30s. And um, so we always had a little bit of international flavor in the house. I mean, everybody on both sides of the family were not from the United States. And in 1972 um, was the Olympics and the Paralympics in Germany. And I had been going to meetings for this organization that I had set up with friends. Um, and there was wheelchair basketball and other sports that were going on there. And so it turned out that this group was going to be going to the Paralympics that were not in Munich. They were in Heidelberg. Because uh, at that time, the Olympics and Paralympics were not held at the same place, the same venue. And we asked my parents permission to go to Germany because we weren't sure that they would like that, and we did. And it was an eye-opening experience for me because I got to meet disabled people from all over the world. And you got to see just in the technology that they were using, um, the disparities that existed. And anybody who got to the games already was at a higher level because they'd made it to be able to be a part of the games. Um, 
But that really perked my interest. And then we went from Germany, yeah, from Germany to Sweden, and you had an option to learn about public policy or to go visit sports programs. So you can guess what I did. So I was interested in learning about public policy in Sweden. And that was, of course, very interesting to be able to, at that point, also learn about issues like healthcare and national healthcare and a variety of other things that were going on in Sweden. And that really, the next year I had the opportunity to go on a tour in Europe. Um, I was sponsored by a group called Rehabilitation International and the uh, International Red Cross had a summer youth camp in Norway for about 30 people, 15 disabled and 15 non-disabled people to come together and talk about what was going on in the world on inclusion of disabled people. That was pretty amazing, 1973. And then I visited a couple of other countries. But I met a person who later became one of my best friends who was from Finland and became an international figure in the disability rights movement. And I think these different kinds of connections also began to allow us to make connections with disabled people in other countries. And um, in 1980, there was an organization uh, that was started uh, called, oh my goodness, why am I forgetting? Um, DPI. DPI, oh my God, shoot me. Uh, disabled People's International, which was a break off a, a organization from another group. What was important about DPI was the fact that it was cross disability and I was mentioning that earlier, the ability to understand discrimination across the board, but being able to come together as a unified group. So that was one of the things that was very important about DPI. Um, but also what was important about that is they were denied a role within this other international group called Rehabilitation International that had sponsored me to go overseas and decided that if they didn't get the role they wanted within this organization, they were gonna set up their own group. So, and that organization had affiliates in countries around the world. And so we were meeting people where our stories were very similar. Obviously, the difference being money and the difference being what was going on in countries in general you know, were the countries in general uh, democratic? Were the voices of citizens in a particular country disabled or not? Were they being recognized? But it really encouraged us as disabled people from around the world to begin to get together. And one thing that I, I've always found important is to be able to listen and learn about what's going on in other countries. But I think many disabled people around the world uh, legitimately look at what's been going on in the US and look at things that we've done. We're not perfect, um, but I think that we're able to demonstrate that coming together and having our voices heard, becoming knowledgeable about legislation, challenging the system, doing various things can really make a difference. And in 1980-81, when it was the UN International Year of Disabled People, there were three international documentaries that were done on the US, one by the Brits, one by the Canadians, and one by the Japanese, all interesting pieces, if you can find them archivally. Um, but then in the 1990s, we really began to see a, a really stronger movement happening where the UN was playing a very important role. And again, I think the UN has been critically important in this area because it's been an opportunity for disabled people to come together and to convene and discuss serious issues. So when, how many of you have heard of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities? Okay, so a reasonable number of you. So the CRPD, I think, has been pivotal um, because disabled people from around the world came together for about four years, two to three times a year for two to three weeks at a time, and really were able to um, hone their issues really come forward in looking at how to put a treaty together that's reasonably strong. But it also allowed people to work with 
representatives from their governments because it was the UN, so they were working with the delegations from all the member countries of the UN. That was very, very important. So, and for me, my job at the World Bank and at the State Department uh, really allowed me the opportunity to both try to work within the system and try to get the system to be more responsive on disability issues. So when I first came to the bank, um, you know, the bank is economists, 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 data, data, data. So we had been able to uh, bring a fellow on who was an economist with a PhD from a renowned university and the Kennedy Foundation paid for him. And we went over and we had a meeting with the office that dealt with all the data. And with a straight face, I asked if they could please share with me the information they had on disability. Now, I knew they had nothing. But I couldn't say that because they'd say, how do you know? So I said, oh. And they said, it'll take them a month to be able to review what they're doing. So in a month, we had a meeting where they told us they didn't have anything. <laughs> So the important part of that, though, was that they acknowledged that they didn't. And so one of the areas that's very important for many people is the issue of the data. What does the data show us? How do you know? How do you know that people are poor? How do you know that they're highly undereducated? On and on. So at the bank, what was going on then and now with the new special advisor, um, Charlotte, it's continuing to work on getting people in the field to go out and meet and talk with disabled people, to confront government, to really get a better understanding of what government is or isn't doing, to be able to look at what can be done to provide convening opportunities, and to begin to change policies and practices. And I think, you know, work that Diana and other uh, foundations are doing, as she said, they're relatively small. When you really look at the development agenda overall, um, it's great, $32 million. You should be nothing but proud of it. But when you look at organizations like USAID and DFID, and you look at the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and over 10 years, the billions of dollars that they've spent when you ask them how disability has been included, you can see that it's very minimally being done. So that's, I think, what's very important for all of you who are gonna be going out and doing whatever it is if disability is part of your work, is really to be putting the disability lens on and to challenge people. Because many of you are younger, you're undergraduates, you're graduate students, but you need to come in being able to lift your voices up to talk about not only what the problem is, but what solutions are. And I think that's one of the things about the work that Diana and others are doing, is to be able to talk about problems and solutions. People need to understand what solutions are. And those solutions may not be broadly being applied, and they may need to be adopted and adapted um, to the country that you're working in. But sitting down, and I always did this when I was at state, when I went to the embassies, there had to be convenings, not of people who were speaking f on behalf of disabled people, but the voices of disabled people coming in to be able to be a part of the discussions. And those changes are not easy. People have got a lot on their plate. And talking to people by saying, we're not asking you to take a new issue on, we're asking you to look at disability in the context of violence against girls and women. What do you know about violence against girls and women when it pertains to disabled people? What do you know about education? Who is dropping out of school? What, what are teachers getting trained? Just look at it in the context of what you're doing. So, so we're, I can't believe we're at the end of our hour. The time has flown by. I think one of the things that I am taking away from this conversation is the importance of people coming together to listen and to learn and to talk and to talk and to organize yes so i hope that maybe some of that is sparked by t uh the car conversations this evening and i hope that as many people have expressed to me 
that um, will maintain um, some momentum in continuing those conversations. So one of the things I had asked was um, in the policies programs that are being run out of this institute, how is disability being included? And I think it's not necessarily being included that much. And so I think the issue is from these discussions and others, what can be done to begin to put a disability lens on work that's coming out from here and from other parts of the institution. Um, we don't know the answers to everything, but beginning to ask the questions. And as I said, I really do believe that money inspires people to learn things that they didn't necessarily feel that they needed to learn before. In your Ford, one of the documents that came out of your work at the Ford Foundation, you distinguished between snacking and having meals. So. I Meal think time. we're in the snacking category right now, but I, but, but I think there's a lot of people ready to sit down and have some serious meals. So please join me in thanking. Thank you.